All right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're very pleased to present uh, Alejandra Quintos uh, today. Uh, she's speaking about dependent stopping times and an application to credit risk theory. Um, Alejandra is completing her PhD in statistics at Columbia University under the direction of Professor Philip uh, Prater, who's actually here tonight. Uh, her research interests lie in applied financial problems and probability, stochastic processes and statistics. Alejandra held a Fulbright grant which she was one of the finalists for the 2021 presidential awards for outstanding teaching by a graduate student at Columbia University. Before grad school, she worked for Citigroup in, in anti-money laundering of all things in Mexico. She held a merit scholarship and majored in actuarial sciences in La Universidad de San Americas in Puebla. She's welcome to welcome in questions during her presentation, so you don't have to wait until the end. Uh, if you're shy, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll call on you. Also, Alejandro, don't worry about uh, monitoring the, the talk. We'll take care of uh, you know, admitting late entrance or anything like that. Just focus on your, your presentation. Uh, so everyone, please join me in welcoming uh, Alejandra Quintos. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm talking about my latest work with you, sharing it. So let me tell you a little bit about how I'm gonna structure the talk. So the talk is divided in two parts. In the first part, I talk about the mathematical model I give examples and I try to provide some intuition so that hopefully this part is not too dry. And I ask you to keep up with me during this first part because it is important for the second part where I will provide the application to math finance, more specifically to credit risk. This is joint work with Professor Philip Rother, my advisor at Columbia and with Professor Robert Jarrow from Cornell University. And so with that, let us start. So first, let me start talking by something that we always try to model in probability, right? When does an event occur? And by event, I mean like things like the time a train arrives, the time a company defaults on its loans, or now lately, unfortunately, we're talking a lot about this, the time a person gets first symptoms of COVID-19. And these events often are modeled as a stopping time. And I'm gonna be representing them mostly as tau, so, but before, what is a stopping time? For the purposes of the talk, and just so that you get the big picture, all you need to, like, there's a proper definition of stopping times, which I'm not gonna keep, but all you need to know about a stopping time is that it's a positive random variable, not negative random variable, and that it has, it satisfies certain measurability properties. And just to give more intuition, what is this measurability property? How do you know something is a stopping time? Okay, it's something that you know based on the information that you have today. The typical examples of stopping times are what I'm giving here. And then just so that we better understand this concept, an example of something that is not a stopping time is when you need to look into the future. For example, the last time you see someone, because when you see them for the last time, you don't know it's the last time, right? Like you would need to see into the future and see that you won't see them again. So that's not a stopping time. And I'm telling you all this because, well, the talk is, is the title is Dependent Stopping Times. So I'm gonna be talking about several stopping times. But before going into several, let me talk about the case of just one stopping time to get us started. So let me assume I have a complete probability space with its filtration, right? Um, FD, keep track of this calligraphic F because I'm gonna be using it a lot through the, through the talk. Uh, this is all the information uh, that I have. And I have my adapted RD valued Cadillac stochastic process. Here you can see the influence of my advisor. Cadillac is just French for continuous on the right with left limits. Um, you can think of this XT uh, if you want as a continuous process, a diffusion, maybe. Uh, it doesn't have to be continuous. Cadillac is enough. Okay. And then, given a stopping time tau, I can construct this process, which is a sub martingale. Why? Because it is increasing. And also it is adapted. That comes from the properties of stopping times. Okay. And now to measure the composition tell us that having this on Martingale, there exists a unique predictable non-decreasing right continuous process called the compensator AT, which I will denote like this, and I'll keep denoting it like in this with this way for the rest of the talk. And this AT compensates the process and creates a martingale empty. So just to give more intuition, so we have an increasing process, right? And we know that a consequence of, of being a martingale is that you will have constant expectation. So if we have an increasing process. If we want any hope to have a constant expectation, then we need to subtract another increasing process to make it like constant to compensate, hence the name of compensator. And we can further assume, further assume that AT has 
absolutely it's absolutely continuous. So it has this form here. And for sufficient conditions to assume this, you can look at these papers. And the more general result is in Janssen et al. I have the reference at the end in case you're interested. Um, and so from this construction, we can see that tau determines alpha, right? Like I'll give you a tau and you will be able to determine the compensator and hence determine these alpha. Is. But now what if we change the question? Um, what if we are given an alpha S and we wanna determine tau? How do we go about this? This is pretty standard in the literature and I'm just going through this because I'm gonna be using it a lot through the rest of the talk. And I want us all to be on the same page, right? So how do we do it? Now I'll give you an alpha and you wanna construct tau. So for that, for, we need to enlarge the space with this C, which is exponential one, independent, independent of what? If you remember in the previous slide, I had an underlying stochastic process X, the Catlack process. This C is independent of that stochastic process. Um, and I will, for technical reasons, enlarge my filtration. I was first working in the F filtration and I need to enlarge it with this new uh, random variable and I will recover the G filtration. And this is where I'm gonna be working now. And I have this alpha, it's a function known as the intensity, which is a positive continuous non-random function. Um, um, and this alpha is also called, besides the intensity, is also called as the instantaneous rate of default on the, or the instantaneous arrival rate. And you'll see in a minute why it has this name, okay? And then I will use what is known as the Cox construction to create a stopping time in the G filtration, in the, in, in the expanded one, right? How am I gonna construct it? In, construct it in this way. So I'll see the first time that this integral goes beyond my exponential random variable. And if I do this, I can show that the survival probability or like tau being greater than t is just equal to this. Let's look at this for a minute. So the event tau being greater than t is equivalent to the event c being greater than this, than this integral. Um, here we need to exploit the property of c being exponential, right? It's crucial that c is exponential because then c greater than this integral, we recover this, right? Uh, and note that here, uh, both quantities on the left side and the right side are random. Ran the randomness comes through this excess. And the reason why I wrote that thing on the right is because uh, like sometimes people wonder, like, okay, why do you have an expectation here? Because again, remember that I have the randomness coming through my stochastic process. So in here, let me make another observation. Sometimes through the talk, I'll say alpha random, but I don't mean that the function is random, but because I'm gonna be evaluating it at the stochastic process, then in that moment it becomes random. So that's what I mean by alpha random. And now let's look at a simpler case. So if alpha is constant alpha for all S, then we recover that tau follows an exponential alpha, right? Like here, it would just be uh, uh, alpha t, and we can see that tau follows an exponential alpha. And the way I like to think about this uh, Cox construction or Cox process is the, the following. So if we start again by alpha s being constant alpha, then what we recover here is the first jump of a Poisson process. Right? But in mathematics, we like to start generalizing things. And so it, when we, like this, I will, another thing like, before I, I go any further, if we are in the constant, in the case of constant alpha, then we know that this alpha in the exponential represents the arrival rate, right? And that's why I was saying that alpha is the instantaneous arrival rate or the instantaneous default rate, because it comes like, you can establish a relationship by this exponential alpha. Okay, so let, uh, let me continue. So if it's constant alpha, then, I recover the first jump of a Poisson process. But then we might wanna say, okay, now I don't want to have alpha constant, but I wanna have it dependent on time. It's not gonna be random, but it's gonna be dependent on time. So by this construction, what I will recover is the first jump of a non-homogeneous Poisson process. But then you say, okay, I wanna go a step further and now I wanna make it random. And if you make the intensity random, a, a random process, I mean, then you will recover the doubly stochastic Poisson process. Doubly stochastic because I have randomness coming from the intensity and from the exponential. Note that in this case that I'm presenting here, this way of making alpha random is through the underlying stochastic process X. It's in a really particular way to make it random. Okay, so I did that for one stopping time. 
but as you might imagine, my talk is dependent on stopping time. So I want to do it for multiple stopping times, right? How do I go about that? So if I let's start by two, let's not be too ambitious. So let's start by two stopping times. So I will just have to make the same construction twice. So I it's this is exactly what I had in the previous page. C1 and C2 are IID exponential one, and they are independent of the stochastic process X. And so I construct my tau one and tau two, right? Uh, with different alphas. And from here, what can I see? So tau one and tau two, because of all the restrictions I have put into the problem, have continuous distributions. And also given F, remember that F is the, the filtration, tau one and tau two are independent. So if we have these two properties, continuous distribution, and, in the, and the, they are independent, the tau one and tau two, then the probability of them being equal is zero. And here is where we, where, where when we started with, the, with our research, this was our objective. We, wanna, we wanted to find a joint distribution of tau one and tau two, such that the probability of them being equal is different from zero. And clearly, if they are independent, as I explained here, then you cannot, you don't have any hope of achieving this. I'm gonna present the model, but before, let me tell you a little bit about how this work came about. So it was summer 2021, we were in the middle of the pandemic and we were wondering, okay, so a lot of models in epidemiology, they say like time to infection follow exponential distribution and they are IID, the time to infection. But if that's the case, it's, you will have this, the probability of two times to inf till infection being equal is zero. But what we were seeing in reality is that people were getting infected at the same time in these super spread events. So that kind of motivated our work and that's how we started. Then our work took a different direction and we did a math finance application, but that's also a possible application of what I'm gonna present today. And just to motivate a little bit more, also uh, last summer, this unfortunate event happened in Florida where uh, the Chaplain Towers, uh, uh, they collapsed. And after the collapse, people started studying why did they collapse? And one professor, Roberto Leon, a professor of construction engineering at Virginia Tech said the following, I don't think the building collapsed just because of one reason. What we tend to find in forensic investigations is that three or four things have to happen for a collapse to occur that is so catastrophic. So here, there's another possible application of the model I am about to present. I will first present the case of two stopping times, but then I, I, I'll show you how you can generalize it to multiple stopping times. And here is three or four things have to happen at the same time, right? So it could be another possible application just to motivate a little bit more what I'm about to do. So now let me tell you about our model. So our model, well, first let me stop for a second. Are there any questions? So our model was inspired by, uh, by some work of Marshall and Olkin. It's a paper from the 60s. It's a great paper on bivariate exponentials. If you have a chance to read it, I will like really encourage you to do so. It's really beautifully written and really accessible. And so, okay. And there's some previous related work by Giseke, but we go a little bit beyond of what he did. And he also only considered like uh, the case, a really applied case to math final, like an application to math finance. He didn't uh, did in a more general scenario. Okay. So for that, to construct our model, I need to assume that we have three conditionally independent stopping times. Now I'm gonna call them eta one, eta two, and eta naught. And I have my three IID exponentials of parameter one, which are independent of the underlying stochastic process, and I have my three alpha, right? And now the stopping times that I'm gonna be looking at are this tau one and tau two. How do I construct them? By setting the minimum of eta one and eta naught and eta two and eta naught. Here, you can already see that this tau one and tau two are not gonna be independent, right? Because both of them depend on eta naught. So that's the first thing. And now, before studying in any further, and like here, like what we were trying to find again is to have a positive pr probability of them being equal. But before going into that, let me find the joint distribution. And here's the first theorem. Um, here, I'm just pretty much repeating what I've been saying, the conditions I've been saying. So I have this AIP, which is the integral of alpha i, 
this alpha is a positive continuous non-random function, and I have x, which is an RD value that cuts like the stochastic process. It's adapted to the filtration, and it's independent of these c's. And some condition that I hadn't said before is that I need to assume that this limit is infinity so that everything is properly defined. But if that's the case, then I can see that the survival function of this tau 1 and tau 2 is of this form. And now in the next slide, I'm just going to copy this result so that to, to say some remarks about it. But the conditions, like I'll, I'll remove it. So I'm copying the result from the previous slide. And recall that is AI just stands for the integral. So from here, again, one can see, I had already said that by construction, tau 1 and tau 2 are not independent. And we can also see it here because we cannot factorize this joint survival function into two parts that only depend on S and T, right? So that's uh, for their conference, my, my, what I was saying. But the first remark is that the joint distribution has an absolutely continuous and a non-trivial singular part. And precisely this non-trivial singular part is what will give me the thing that I was looking for. Namely, that the probability of tau one equals tau two is different from zero. And I'll explain uh, later. Uh, and an easy way to see that there's a non-trivial singular part is by taking the second mixed partial derivatives and you integrate that and you'll see that it won't integrate to one. And so the, you have there the non-trivial singular part. Also, let me note that marginally each tau i follows an ex is like a, the Cox process that I first presented when I started introducing this, the case of one stopping time, right? So in a way, our model is a generalization, it's a multivariate Cox process because marginally each stopping time follows a Cox process. Furthermore, I can assign alpha, I just constant alpha, and then I recover the bivariate exponential introduced by Marshall and Olkin with these parameters, alpha one, alpha not, and uh, alpha two and alpha not. So those are my three remarks. Are there any questions? And now finally, what I was uh, look, looking for, right? Uh, that the probability of tau one equal tau two is different from zero. And from here, you can see that this, will, remember that this expectation, I take it because I have the randomness coming through the stochastic process. And so you can see here that as long as alpha node is different from zero, this probability will be different from zero, which is what I was looking for. And just to give us more intuition, some uh, easier cases, for example, uh, if alpha is just constant alpha, then, well, I don't need the expectation anymore because then uh, I basically ignore the underlying stochastic process. And so I recover uh, this ratio, which is just, you can also think as like the, what is the probability you have three exponential? What is the probability that one of them is the minimum, right? Well, no, I said that like the, specifically the one that is labeled as either not is the minimum. More surprisingly, or maybe not so, if you have all the intensities being the same, even if they are a function of the underlying stochastic process, then we recover that the probability of the two stopping times being equal is one third. And I said, not so surprisingly, because if we have that them, they are all equal, then we have symmetry, right? And we only have three cases, either tau one is smaller than tau two, tau one is greater than tau two, or tau one is equal to tau two. So we can expect because of the symmetry, each one of these scenarios to have a probability of one third. And then if alpha i is, is just proportional to alpha naught, I can also like, even if they, they are a function of the underlying stochastic process, then I don't need this expectation here. And I recover this result. This is just to give more intuition and one can potentially assume other functions alpha and get some results. And also here, there comes another proposition in which, okay, now I won't let time go to infinity. And what do I, if I just wanna like uh, stop at time t, what do I get? Well, not so surprising. I get a similar result as in the previous slide, but instead of this guy being infinity, it's just still t, but the integral is the same. And this might be useful to get conditional expectations, conditional probabilities such as the one that I'm given here, like, okay, I know that tau one is smaller than t, what is the probability of these two being equal? Again, here, my expectation is here because of the uh, underlying stochastic process, that's where the expectation is taken. And also if I have more information and I know that both tau one and tau two are smaller than t, uh, I can get the probability of these two stopping times being equal. And like, as you can see, like, although I'm giving this model in a really general scenario, because I, I here I'm not giving any specific alpha, 
it's only I have the underlying stochastic process. I know that alpha is a continuous non-random function. And like I can get explicit expressions. And as soon as you give me a specific alpha, then I can reduce this further, right? And then when I was starting with one stopping time, I said that alpha is known as the instantaneous rate of default. And the reason is that also is because when you only have one stopping time, remove this tau two, pretend it doesn't exist, and also pretend this doesn't exist. So, and you do this kind of limit that is like the instantaneous survival probability, you know that tau one is greater than t, and you wanna see what is the probability that it happens in the next instant, that is the alpha associated with this tau. So we wanted to see what happened in the case of two stopping times. And in this case, if you have the same t, what you recover when you take the limit is whatever is what they have in common, alpha naught. And then, well, if you have two, you are allowed, like one time can be smaller than the other, right? And this is what we do in the, in the second line here. But now we have to send epsilon faster to zero and we re to recover a non-trivial limit. And what we get is this. And just to give you more intuition, so tau two is, gr is, is greater than tau one, right? Because S is greater than T. And we know that tau one is, uh, this, is the, this is given. So for tau, Alpha naught will always be associated with whatever is greater of the two stopping times. And in this case, it's tau two. So that's why this alpha naught is associated with that one. But it will become more clear, it will become clearer in a second when I present another interpretation of the model. Okay. Now let me. And here is one of the results besides the survival probability. Maybe I should have highlighted that. This is if you want to take away one result for the second part of the talk, this is the one probably this is even more important than the survival probability. Because here, I'm in mean, the simpler case of only two stopping times. And in the second part of the talk, I'll present multiple stopping times. And this expression becomes more complicated here, obviously. But here, when I only have two stopping times and I want to see what is the distance between them, what I want to highlight from the expression on the right is that the line above is just a permutation of the line below. What do I mean by that? So to recover the line below, all you have to do is to change Whenever you see a one here, you change it for a two. And whenever you see a two here, you change it for a one. So there's a permutation. And again, the expectation is because I have the underlying process, uh, stochastic process X, and here this little X is the, 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 the variable of integration. So like, please keep this in mind for the second part of the talk. And now before going to, before generalizing this model for multiple stopping times, let me present a different interpretation of this joint distribution. So the first, in the first, uh, like before, what I did is I presented it through a generalization of Cox process. But let me give a completely different interpretation and get to the same result. So let me suppose I have a two component system. Each component in life is represented as tau one and tau two respectively any component will die after receiving a shock. And these shocks are governed by three independent Cox process, namely lambda one, lambda two, and lambda nine. Events in lambda one are shocks that affect only component one. Events in lambda two are shocks that affect only component two. And events in lambda naught are shocks that affect both components. So if I wanna see the probability of survival of these two uh, components, I need, if I want the first component life to be greater than S, well, first I need to require that in the Cox process lambda one, there are zero shocks till time S. This is what I'm writing here. And just uh, this P tilde means the probability condition on F because remember I have Cox processes and like I have the underlying stochastic process, but if it confuses you, change Cox processes for Poisson process. And then you don't need to condition because then this alpha is just a constant alpha one, constant alpha two, and constant alpha. So just to get the interpretation, you don't need to think about Cox processes, just think about Poisson processes. So, okay, as I was saying, if you want tau one to be greater than S, you need till time S to have zero shocks in the event lambda one. Moreover, you also need something else because these shocks also affect component one, right? But we'll get that in a second. And then if you also need zero shocks in the Cox process or Poisson process lambda two till time t because you want tau two to be greater than t. But again, you also need to take 
to account what, what happens in this lambda node, and that's where I'm going. So because lambda node includes shocks that affect both components, you necessarily need that whatever is greater, S or T, till that time, you have zero shocks. And this is what it's saying here. And this goes back to what I was saying that this lambda node is associated with whatever is greater of them. And then this comes from box processes. If you want zero shocks till time s, this is just exponential minus alpha one s. But if we think about it in terms of Poisson processes, then this alpha one s is just the integral, right? Of alpha one uh, till s. And the integral would be alpha one time s and this is precisely this right so as you can see from here i have a right to the same survival probability i had presented before but in a different way with a different interpretation and the reason why i'm presenting this is because to make a generalization this seems easier to generalize to multiple stopping times right because how do i like let's say that i have k stopping times how do i generalize it then i'll have k plus one independent cox processes and lambda one, lambda two, lambda k, and then lambda naught will be will be events that affect all the components, and then I can generalize. It. But instead of doing that, let me present it as I was doing before with the idea of constructing my stopping times with Cox processes, and I will have now k plus one eta i's. Remember that before I only had three because I had two taus, that one and tau two, and now I have k taus. And look that again, they are not independent because they all depend on eta naught, right? And by a similar argument to the ones I've been presenting, you can find that this is the survival function. And actually, this is the joint survival function that I want you to keep in mind for the second part of the talk, because that's what's uh, going to be important. Are there any questions at this point? Because with this, I conclude the first part of the talk. Okay, so if not, uh, let me continue now with the application. So before a little bit of background, right? Uh, and before even providing the background, let me mention that this is the joint work with Professor Philip Prater and Professor Robert Jarrow. The previous, uh, the first part of the talk was only with Philip, uh, but okay, now the background. So let us consider the possibility of the collapse of the financial system. This was really close to happening in 2008, right? And all I want you to take away from this point that I'm writing here is that it was quite hard to recover from the collapse of even one globally systemically important bank, namely Lehman Brothers. I'll explain in a second what a globally systemically important bank uh, and Lehman Brothers will be the key example. And okay, so AIG had to be bail, bail out, Maryland Lynch had to be bought. Like you can see the all the, the events that were a consequence of this collapse of Lehman Brothers and how the, the market was about to fail, right? And this motivated regulators to characterize the probability of a financial market failure known as systemic risk. And before like uh, going any further, let me say what is a globally systemically important bank. From now on, I'll call them GCIPs. These are large enough banks such that if they fail, their failure affect the health of the financial system, just like Lehman Brothers, right? Like in the previous slide I showed that, or I just give some examples of what happened after Lehman Brothers collapse. And how does a bank get designated as a GCIP? It gets designated as a GCIP if various indicators of its financial hate in aggregate except some threshold. And they are designated by the Financial Stability Board, FSB, Every year in November, they publish a list of the banks that they that are considered GCIPs. In 2021, there were 30. In 2020, there were also 30. In 2019, I think 28, 29, but it has been stable around 30. And just some examples of them are, are the ones that I wrote here. This list is by no means exhaustive. And you can see that there are banks, American banks, European banks, and also Asian banks. Now, let me tell you about what is the measure of systemic risk that we want to propose. So it is the probability that any two GCIPs default at the same time. And by the same time, we mean within a short time period of each other. And what's the idea behind this measure is motivated by the example that I provided from 2008. So if one GCIP fails, 
regulators can manage the resulting crisis to ensure that a market-wide failure does not occur. Just like what happened in 2008, regulators managed the crisis and then the market didn't fail. However, if two or more GCs fail within a short period of time, the crisis is uncontrollable by regulators and the market fails. And now some characteristics, characteristics of our forward-looking measure, well, it is consistent with the economic theories related to the causes of financial market failures. It also uses the existing regulatory designations of GCs. Uh, it can be estimated using existing hazard rate methodologies. And here, uh, it goes precisely, uh, it's precisely related to the idea of the Cox processes because that's hazard rates and it's something widely used in credit risk. You have the reduced form approach and the structural approach. This is the reduced form. And it also facilitates quantifying the impact of regulatory policy change on systemic risk. And this, to this last point, I will come back at the end of the talk and I'll show you how one can quantify the impact of these changes. And now let me talk about the model. So I'll consider a financial market that contains KGCs and I will fix a probability space with, if, with its filtration, a filter probability space satisfying the usual conditions and large enough to support. I won't go through, to, through the usual conditions, but you think that everything is nice. And I have my RD valued Cadillac stochastic process. Again, this goes back to the first part of the talk. And now I have K plus one IID exponential one. Here you should already be thinking hopefully about the generalization of the, the, the model that I presented on the last slide of the first part of the talk. So I'll have KGC. And now here I will give a meaning of X to the underlying stochastic process that I already had before. So here X will represent state variables characterizing the health of the economy and the KGC. Remember that X is in a stochastic process in RD, so it can include many things, macro variables such as inflation rate, the unemployment rate, etc., and GCP-specific variables such as capital ratios, liquidity ratios, etc. And now I'll start defining things. And again, this shouldn't surprise you; like it's really similar to what I introduced in the first part of the talk. So first, I'll talk about the GCP default time due to idiosyncratic events. And what is an idiosyncratic event? is one that is unique to the GC after conditioning on the state variable process X. For example, fraudulent, fraudulent trades by a rock trader or incompetent management. So it's something really GC specific, right? And let me define the default time as this eta i from i till k. It's just, again, as before, like uh, this uh, is a stopping time. And again, the a i is just the integral. And because they are independent and they are have continuous distribution as before, like the probability of them being equal is zero. And let me provide an example that I will be coming back multiple times through the talk. So now, if moreover, this AI, besides being a function of the underlying stochastic process, is a function of the number of GCs, and I further assume that this alpha I increases with K, I'll have what is non-destructive competition. And I'll show you in a second, in like two or three slides uh, uh, later, how is that if this K is this alpha increase, the alpha I increases with K, that is the instantaneous rate of default in this case, because we are talking about defaults, then the probability of survival decreases. And why did we pick this example? This is motivated by what happened in 2007 when banks invested in riskier AAA CDOs instead of riskless US treasury bonds to obtain increasing yields. Because the idea is that if, there, if the instantaneous rate of default increases with K, then like there are more GCs, right? And they wanna keep their part of the, of the market and they start trading more aggressively and they start tra taking riskier and risk riskier trades. And then that might make them more prone to default, right? So that's the idea. And then let me define another one because I'm still missing my eta node, right? Like I had all my, already my eta one to okay, but I'm missing the eta node. This will be the first time that a market-wide stress event, stress event occurs. Differently from my idiosyncratic default, this event is not default, it's not GC specific. It affects all of them. For, and this will include the influence of the remaining non GCPs in the market because in the economy, there are not only GCPs, right? There's also small banks that if enough of them default, then they can provoke a market-wide stress event. And it also includes the interrelations among themselves and the GCPs. Just some examples of market-wide stress events are the posting of an asset price bubble 
or as I was saying, a large collection of non G6 defaulting in a short period of time. And so we have that. And now finally, I define the G6 default time. I'll define it, not surprisingly, as the minimum of the eta naught and eta i. That is, the default time of the i G6 is the first time that either the GCIP default due to an idiosyncratic event or a market-wide stress event occur. And here one can see that the market, the survival probability of the IGCIP is just the, and this is not surprising because it's exactly what I presented in the first part of the talk, um, which is like the Cox process. And just going back to the example of the structured competition, remember that I said that alpha I increases with K. So then that means that I, AI increases with K. And with these minuses decreases, so the probability of survival decreases with K effectively. And before like presenting the mesh, our measure of systemic risk, it's important to take a look again at the joint survival function. But I hope that this expression is not surprising because this was, was the, the last uh, thing I had in the well the in the last slide of the first part of the talk. Uh, maybe I use a little bit of different notation, but the same. And again, this expectation is here because I have the randomness coming through the stochastic process X. And here I'm also gonna present the case of well, when, when the intensity is just constant alpha, uh, because maybe this will clarify things a little bit more. If I put constant alpha, then I can reduce this expression a little bit and I can remove the expectation. And now, finally, our measure of systemic risk. So this is, the probability of any of these two defaults occurring within an epsilon uh, period of time, right? For any of, for some ij in, in, in ij. So let's analyze this. A market failure in this case can occur for two reasons. A market-wide stress event occurs and then all of them default at the, at the same time, or two GCs experience idiosyncratic defaults events within an epsilon period of each other, and then we will have effectively that the distance between them is less than epsilon. And the idea again behind our measure is what's inspired by what happened in 2008 is that if one GC fails, regulators can manage the resulting crisis to ensure that a market-wide failure does not occur. However, if two or more GCs fail within a short period of time, the crisis is uncontrollable by regulators and the market fails. And here we have like the case of two or more occurring within a short period of time. And now like the math, right? Here, I know this expression looks a little bit like mysterious, but here is what I ask you to, to think about that the case of two stopping times, that expression that I highlighted in the first part of the talk. Because um, if you remember, I, I, I highlighted the fact that you just have to do a permutation. And if you think the case k equals two, what is the probability of tau i minus tau j being, epsilon, being less than epsilon for the case if k equals two? Well, you will only have tau one minus tau two less than epsilon. And this goes back to the first part of the talk. Now let's walk together through this expression. So this summation is overall possible permutations of one to k. And again, as I said, when you have K equals two, you only have two permutations. So that's why you only had like those two, two lines in that expression. And then this FJI is just the density condition on, on a given F, right? And this here is the exact formula for the density. And it shouldn't come as a surprise that this looks really similar to the exponential density, right? But the difference is that this alpha is now a function of an underlying stochastic process if not constant alpha. And then, uh, well, as I said, this sum is taken over all possible permutation. And like when I say J1, J2, I just, I just fix in a specific permutation. Um, that expression, if you were to do the case K equals two, this, this expression coincides with the one in the first part of the talk. But let's look at more specific examples to hopefully clarify what's going on. So if I have the case of all of them being equal, um, all of them, I mean, all the alphas, uh, that, that, that means that all the etas are IID because they were independent to start with, but now they have the same intensity, so they have the same distribution. And if, so then I can remove that uh, summation and I just have to put the, the size of that summation, which is k factorial because it's the sum over all permutations. And then all these steps are the same. And by the same, I mean just uh, these 
which is the, the well, the same alpha for all of them. And then uh, if I now look at the case of constant default intensity, in which now I forget about the underlying stochastic process, uh, and uh, they might be different uh, constant, but they are constant, then I can remove the, they, I can actually solve the integrals, but I cannot get rid of the summation over all permutations. And then by solving the integrals, I recover this. And as you can see, in this case, the market failure probability is easily computed given estimates of the default intensity. And I'm also presenting this because once you give me a specific alpha, I'm able to reduce further that uh, expression from like this uh, scary expression, I can reduce it further. Again, this is, this is the most general case here. Then when you give me a specific alpha, I can do more. And well, one might ask uh, here, I was saying that if you have some estimates, you can compute these, uh, this in a, an explicit way, but if you were not to have estimates, maybe you are happy with having some bounds, right? And then, uh, so for some empirical application, it might be useful to obtain bounds. And we provided these bounds in the papers. Um, we have an upper bound and a lower bound. Of course, if you were only have some estimates for these alpha i's, you can like potentially remove some terms in the sum, but then that will make the bound worse, but it's just a proposal for a bound. And then for the lower bound, the advantage is that you don't have to do the integrals anymore. Like uh, the turn of integrals that I had before, like it's only yeah, this, but the trade-off is that you do have the summation over all permutations. So that's that. And uh, just to, to show you that this model, although it's in a really general way, it allows for specific for explicit computations. So now let me be very uh, catastrophic and say like, okay, now I wanna see what is the uh, probability that all of these events, all of these GCFs default within epsilon. So the occurrence of all default times, or also you can think of it as the maximum of them happens before epsilon. So I can get again an explicit expression and this expectation is again, because I have the underlying stochastic process in the more general way and as some special cases. If I assume that all the a epsilons are the same from for all the for i one till k, then if I send k to infinity, I can see that what ends up mattering is the the alpha naught. Like I can basically forget about this ai, or like a basically it's just a naught the ones that end up mattering. And also let me go back to the case of destructive competition, in which I'll have the same. Uh, alpha i for uh, one till k, but I also add the component that this alpha i is changing with k in a really specific way, in a logarithmic way, then to get a non-trivial limit, I need epsilon to be smaller than zero. In the paper, we do have the, the, the result for epsilon equal one and epsilon, sorry, I said epsilon is smaller than zero, but I meant one. So we have, the, here is the result epsilon is smaller than one, but in the paper, we have epsilon equal to one and epsilon greater than one then we can see again that what ends up mattering is this eta naught, the distribution of this eta naught. And here, when we were doing this, we were wondering, okay, now what would happen if we modify the number of GCs, right? And that would also have a nice economic interpretation because for regulatory purposes, it is important to understand the impact of including another GC, right? Our intuition tells us that to decrease the market failure probability, the number of GCs should be decreased. How do you decrease them? You break them up into smaller institutions. And our intuition, our intuition happens to be right because we have a theorem in which if you increase the number of GCs, then the probability of a market failure increases, right? And so, I mean, if in the first line you have K GCs and then fix all the alpha i's for those K GCs, including the alpha naught, and also fix the underlying uh, process, but then add a another GCP with a different alpha i, and then the probability will increase. And one might think if I send k to infinity, will the limit be one? And that's exactly what we did. So the previous results suggest that as the number of GCP goes to infinity, the market failure probability converts to one, but it's not guaranteed just by uh, what I have presented so far, but we were actually able to prove that when you say k to infinity, uh, this probability converges to one. So this even this is another proof 
that the number of GC, the number of GCIPs in the economy needs to be regulated restricted to ensure that the probability of a market failure is at an acceptable level. And then the excess number of GCIPs must be broken up into smaller bands. But what if it's not possible to break them up into smaller bands? So maybe what a regulator should do is require the existing GCIPs to change their asset or liability structure. For example, the required capital of a GCIP. Remember that when I introduced what a GCIP was, I said, like to be considered a GCIP, they need to meet certain thresholds, right? So regulators can change these thresholds. And now we investigate the impact of changes in the initial conditions on the market failure probability so that regulators can see what, uh, what is the impact of them changing these, these um, thresholds. But to, in order to do that, I need to change what I have defined a little bit. Not so much, but please keep up with me. So remember that I had X, my underlying stochastic process in RD. Now I will make explicit that is a vector in RD, um, the components, and then R is the time. And so alpha, remember that was a function that takes the vector in RD and like maps it into R, right? So I just write explicitly. And now let me redefine the default time of the IGC due to idiosyncratic events and the first time that a market-wide stress event occurs my eta i and my eta not. Before, I didn't have these guys here. And now I make them explicit, the value at time zero x not. That's the only difference that I added this explicitly here. And just as before, the default time of the IGC will be the minimum of eta not and eta i. And let's see how that changes what I have presented so far. So now, because of that change I made, the difference is that eta i the survival probability of eta i will be this one. And here you can see that now this guy is explicitly here. And the same, and this will affect the survival probability of tau i. And like I'll have these guys here. And this is great because what we wanted is to see how changing these initial conditions would affect our measure of systemic risk. But before affecting our measure of systemic risk, it affects the survival probability. However, there's a problem here. Problem is that this does not define a proper probability because if you set eta i greater than zero, this should be one, but it is not one. So we fix it. And um, when we fix it, it also has a nice interpretation. So to ensure that the probability distributions of tau i and eta i are properly defined, we need to assign a positive probability to the event eta i equals zero. And then we assign what we need it to be so that the probability is properly defined. And this in time will imply that the probability of tau i being equal to zero is equal to this. And what is the interpretation that we gave? That there is a positive probability of an instantaneous default at time zero. And now by doing that, we are able to compute a derivative. We wanted to see the change in our measure if we change one of the initial conditions. So this derivative, is taken with respect to the L component in the RD stochastic vector at time zero. So the, what I mean is I'm changing the initial condition uh, L, the L in initial condition at, at initial at time zero. And I see how that affects my measure of systemic risk. And we get an explicit result. And um, this is inside the expectation again, because it depends on X naught. And what we get if we give a specific example, like namely that like this alpha is just a uh, weighted average. You can think of it maybe as a, well, it does, it here is not necessarily a weighted average, but you can think of it as a weighted average of your, of your uh, underlying stochastic process. This specific alpha will require the X. Now it has to be continuous, not only CATLAT. It has to be continuous and positive, but let's assume that we have this specific alpha. Then if we take the derivative, uh, like just basically an application of this theorem to this specific alpha, then we, net, we get this nice looking expression. And I say nice looking expression because this guy here is just the complement of our measure of systemic risk. And then these beta i's get out of here because they are just constant. And so we hope that these partial derivatives can help regulators to determine the impact of their regulatory restrictions on the probability of a market failure. And this like 
is what I was saying, another the fourth point or fifth point of why our measure is a good measure. And with that, I conclude the talk. Uh, here, here's the reference for the papers I'm presenting. The first one is the mathematical model, is available on archive. And the second one is the second part of the talk, the application to math finance. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Alejandro. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, has anyone got a question that they'd like to ask at this time? If not, I'm happy to jump in myself. I have, um, I'd had the pleasure of participating in 2008 in a, a kind of systemic risk exercise where we were trying to look at the um, liquidity um, availability and requirements in times of stress um, for these GSIBs. And the kind of model that we built was, it seems similar to yours in many ways, except that it wasn't so much um, probabilistic, like, uh, you know, sort of conditionally exponentially distributed, but rather more like the exercise of an option, you know, when your liquidity falls to a critical level uh, and you're Lehman Brothers, and you haven't got any more cash to cover your margin, that's when you're going to default, right? Uh, and so you could model your state variables, X could be something like the, um, you know, liquidity needs of all of these, um, these GSIBs. You could simulate them in, in some kind of uh, fashion with data from, uh, knowing how, what the cross positions are between any pair of, um, of counterparts, uh, and then thereby kind of cope with probabilities um, that we'd have a certain number of, of defaults within the system and determine if we would have sufficient uh, defaults to, to be um, you know, systemically significant. How would your model differ from that sort of approach? So if I got correctly, what you said is you have some process that you are looking at, and when that process hits, a certain barrier, then that's like a, a default event for you, right? Yes. So what you are describing is precisely the structural approach in credit risk. My model is the other one, the reduced form approach, which that you was, don't have- That was my sense, yeah. But you, since, you, since your, your um, coefficients depended on this X variable, I thought there might be some way that you could kind of have a hybrid of the two in a way. Um, maybe, but if you see like, we don't make like, we are only making alpha function of X, right? But we are not saying when X hits a certain value is when this alpha, um, let me go to maybe slide 10, um, it's here. When this goes above my exponential, that's when like the, like, that's how I define my tau. Yeah, okay. So you still have either still have, even after conditioning on X uh, and, and T, you still have this, this sort of exponential density, right? Yeah, yeah, and which is key because otherwise I I'm not able to get this to exponential. Kind of equal, right? However, there's also literature in which they assume, well, now let me make this C different from exponential. What do I get? Like, let me make it just a, a continuous positive random variable and see what do I get? But then you don't get these nice looking, these nice expressions. Okay. Well, that was my hard question. I have one more easy question for you. Um, Thank you, you. Said, you said when you break up the, um, the GSIBs, um, you know, then you might have a higher probability of these kinds of systemic events. But I felt that, well, if, if you really, you actually did break up the GSIBs, um, their total capitalization wouldn't change. So you have a larger number of, of entities, right? And they probably would, some of them would not be GSIBs anymore. Yeah, well, what I said that there is that, um, so you don't wanna have too many GSIBs, right? So yeah. they break them up so that they, lower the number of GCIPs and now they are considering less GCIPs. That's oh, all I see. I so you're, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's all I said. And then, uh, so yeah, they, they, now the banks that were previously GCIPs and now they are banks, like they can also have some kind of impact through this market-wide stress event, what I call eta not. Okay, so you, you aren't saying then that you're, you're not, you're not saying that when those banks are broken up that they they still GSIBs at that time, they become less systemically important. Yeah, 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 exactly. They stop okay. being GSIBs. Great, so I'm sorry I misunderstood that. No, 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 it's okay, I didn't make it that clear. It's fascinating. Uh, any other questions from the audience? This well, is a- uh, David, um, I, if you don't mind, I could make a comment about uh, your question. <clears throat> um, there's a relationship between those the structural models and the reduced that you were talking about and the reduced form models that Alejandro was talking about, which is that um, with a structural model, you kind of assume you know the evolution of the, of the liquidity of the bank. 
and with a st structural model, you and with a reduced form model, you don't assume that knowledge. And you can you can relate the two by by shrinking the filtration of observable events, so that if you can't really see the the evolution of the uh, liquidity of the bank, um, then you can restrict it to. to uh, times when, you, when something happens, when you can see it. And then those times will be what's called totally inaccessible stopping times. And so they, they can be modeled by these Cox constructions that yes, uh, yes. Alejandro was talking about. So you can relate the two by shrinking your, your, um, your sigma algebras of available information to smaller ones. Yeah, I see that's a, that's a very good point. Um, I was thinking though, from the point of view of a regulator, at that time they were collecting liquidity data on all the financial institutions every day and also position data. So they could try to see what the impact would be tomorrow. What happens if, if oil prices uh, you know, cut in half, what happens to all the liquidity demands in the system? So they, it wasn't perfect of course, but they had that kind of machine going you know, and, and then tried to use that machine to, to make these uh, you know, predictions about instability. It's impressive. Like I say, it's not perfect. It's yeah. government. It's all government work, you know, and you, you know it goes with it goes along with that. But, uh. <laughs> what did you think of the quality of the government work when you were there? Oh, I thought the, the concept was was great. Actually, there was um J P Morgan was leading this at, at the time. They were, they had a whole department set up for uh, systemic risk uh, study, which I was quite impressed with. I'd seen a couple of conferences given. There's a I can't remember the woman's name to be honest. Um, but I'd say that the, the concepts were great, uh, but the execution was limited because of, you know, a lot of folks had you know, privacy concerns and uh, there was lags in the data and it was diff difficult to make an effective empirical model, I think from the, from the theoretical constructs. Did you ever think that the data might be suspect, like people were hiding things? Or not? Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> you know, within the bounds of, you know, hoping it's small enough not to be caught, but definitely, uh, you know, just like shaders tread their LIBOR quotes, they're going to also, uh, you know, shade their <laughs> liquidity requirements. Right. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, well, we have one more minute. I'm, I'm hogging all the questions to myself. So if anyone has uh, one to sneak in. Okay, very good. Thank you once again for coming. This was an amazing talk. Uh, Sure, my uh, pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Good luck with your dissertation and your your job market and all that stuff. And uh, obviously, Thank you've you. got some of the some of the best uh, advisors in the in the world. So uh, <laughs> I'm lucky. Yeah, what can I say? You're embarrassing me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if you weren't here, you know, I'd have to talk even more more graciously about you. Anyway, um, thanks everyone for coming. We have um, next week. We will not have a talk, um, but on March 10th, we will have uh, Laura Leal coming. Uh, from Princeton to present. Uh, and I don't have the name of her paper right here, but uh, but you, certainly Zothra will keep you up to date on the um, on the emails. So thanks once again for coming and I hope to see you all in person soon.